Let's talk about Jonas Cespedes, a guy you recently saw. I'm not sure you're aware. And one of the team philosophies <laughs> with the Mets, Sandy, is getting on base. Not really a right. huge part of Jonas Cespedes' yep. game. So how do you balance that skill set compared to what the team philosophy is? Well, you've got to be a little bit flexible given the other things that he brings to the table. Right. And, uh, you know, the other thing that's a possibility, and I'm not Pollyanna, so I mean, I'm not counting on it, but um, getting with the right hitting coach, being surrounded by some players that have a slightly different approach can often, um, you know, shift a player in one direction or the other. I'm really a, a big believer in sort of the critical mass uh, of uh, a lineup and, and what that can do for everybody else that kind of doesn't follow that line. But the bottom line is, you know, with, with the other things that he does, um, you, you know, you've got to make a certain number of compromises. And um, probably very few perfect players out there. And we don't want to be so dogmatic that we're not going to do this, this, or this because of, uh, you know, particular characteristics. So um, take the good with the bad sometimes. You know, hearing you say that, though, over the years, we've talked about when you've been pursuing particular players or looking to get rid of particular players, establishing that culture of the organizational hitting philosophy right. being top down from the whole way. So now you've got your probably your most noticeable star, your marquee guy, who won't likely be modeling that. Is, something that, is that something that you're going to want Kevin or, or, or Terry to address explicitly and say in the clubhouse, hey, this is, this is Yoannis, but we still do what we do? Is that a conversation? Yeah, no, I think that uh, absolutely. And, but look, when you, when you make compromises, uh, make exceptions, then you have to be careful that the exception doesn't become the rule. So, you know, we were hard after Ben Zobrist, as you know, for the reason that uh, you raise on base percentage and the the ability of somebody like a Zobrist um, to create a model for everybody else. Um, but you know, you, you got to shift from time to time, and and Yoannis wasn't necessarily available to us at that time, so. Um, you know, again, it's, it's, it's a net proposition. Um, you add players on a net basis, so are they going to make you better? And um, I think that's how you have to approach every player. So you had a bunch of young pitchers, obviously, that pitched into November. That's a potential yep. strain. There's probably a reason the Giants win every other year, right? The pitchers are tired <laughs> on, on, on the other years. Yep. So is there a way, I mean, we've spoken a little bit about the possibility of spot starts or six-man, but in spring training even, are we going to see, and I know this is, Probably more of a Terry question, but are we going to see guys like Harvey Degrom be eased in explicitly later? Uh, should we not be surprised to see them later, even into March, with nothing necessarily being wrong? Yeah, no, I think what uh, Terry has in mind um, is uh, probably you won't see the Matt Harveys and Degroms for the first four or five games in spring training. That they're going to be backed up a little bit, take it a little slower. Uh, build up their innings uh, toward the in end of spring training a little differently and um, you know be a little protective. We don't really have innings limits on, on uh, our guys going into next season, but I do think we have to be mindful of their health. And uh, so it's not just a matter of counting innings. It's really about keeping guys healthy and strong uh, with the possibility that they'll be going late again into uh, into October. Last spring, one of the stories was Syndergaard and his maturity or lack thereof had his lunch thrown out. There were a lot of questions or rumblings about that. Then he burst on the scene. I mean, how about did, did that maturity catch you off guard as an organization? I mean, did you ever see somebody develop that quickly and embrace being in New York City the way he did? You know, I thought it was it was a little surprising. Yeah, I mean, the the uh, the maturity that he demonstrated from just about the time he arrived at the major league level. Um, I think some of the incidents with him were a little overblown uh, while he was in the minor leagues. But um, what I like is that he has he has matured, but he hasn't uh, lost his personality, and uh, that's why I think he's he's become so popular here in New York. That he's uh, he's he's got a pretty he's demonstrated he's got a pretty good head on his shoulders, but at the same time he in, enjoys his life as a player. He enjoys New York City and. Uh, there's a certain creativity about him, too, hmm. that comes from that comic book. Uh, uh, Thor, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He plays the yeah. character pretty well. He does. Yeah, so uh, it, it was surprising, but uh, also really rewarding because he was ultimately very important to us uh, last season. All right, we have another question from Facebook. This comes from Patrick Gaffney. Do we have a uh, do we have payroll flexibility to add another bullpen arm or veteran bat before the season and or at the trade deadline? 
Well, you know, we only got a 25-man roster here. So, uh, <laughs> um, veteran bat, I would say, unlikely. The, in, in both the, the, the case of a veteran bat and maybe um, a right-handed reliever, uh, we want to preserve some flexibility. So if we were to sign either one to a major league contract, number one, we'd have to move somebody off our 40-man roster. We've already lost a couple of guys as a result of that. And then secondly, we wouldn't have any flexibility once we get into the season. So players on a major league contract, typically if they're older, they're out of options, and so you don't have the flexibility you'd like to have. So um, we may end up adding a couple of people on minor league contracts that we think uh, would provide some good depth for us. But... Um, I don't think we'll be seeing uh, additional major league contracts over the next couple of weeks. I think a name that popped up this offseason is probably not familiar to the general public is Dick Scott, new bench coach, mm -hmm. a guy who's obviously been prominent in the organization yeah. for those who've been watching closely. So this is the part where I ask the question in a way where you don't dismiss it and say, Terry's under contract for two more years. So once you win multiple championships, uh, once Terry's named manager of the year in all of those years and you have a mutually agreed upon uh, a period of time where he decides he's done managing, is Dick Scott a guy who could be in that conversation, who even more broadly is MLB manager material? And I'm asking because the people out there don't know who he is at all. Yeah. Well, Dick was a very accomplished uh, minor league manager for years and then got into player development. This is the first time in his career, and it, it's, it's a 30-year career, uh, he's been on a major league staff. So it's a little premature to be talking about uh, uh, Dick Scott as a manager, and certainly in the context of Terry Collins and the Mets. Uh, um, you know, he was selected because we thought he was the best candidate to be bench coach, uh, given his experience and uh, uh, across the board, and his familiarity with our players as well. So, um, really, the question of managing in the future really wasn't relevant to what we were doing, and it's not something we've, we've really been thinking about. I think it's something great, though, a guy who's actually earned it. He's been there for 30 years. Yeah. Nowadays, you're seeing guys get hired with zero experience. Yeah. So I like that somebody gets rewarded for all the hard work and be a part of a major league roster. No, I, mean, I agree. You see now it changes. Yeah. And do you see him as somebody, uh, he, he was in civilian clothes for much of the past couple of years, is, is, you know, on the different uh, affiliates and doing that job. Yeah. So he's sort of a bridge between the front office and the field staff that you don't necessarily really see as much. Is he part of maybe what's a new paradigm where the manager's office and your office aren't quite as remote as they were traditionally in well, baseball? Well, I, th I think that what we've tried to do is, is, is create uh, a connection. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the way I kind of look at it is that, you know, the front office, myself, John Rico, we make certain decisions during the course of the year. Um, uh, Terry has his purview and makes certain decisions over the course of a season, even to some extent in the off season. But we try to sort of cross pollinate, you know, so that if I've got some ideas, I'll give them to Terry. And if Terry's got some ideas for us, and so the more communication we can have, the more understanding there is uh, with respect to whether it's, you know, analytics or scouting or what have you, the more communication there is between the field and the front office, I think is a good thing.